Hey folks, Nathan here. We are finally back to continue our coverage of Nemesis from Awakened Realms. We are finally going to be taking a look here at the recently delivered Wave 2 from the Kickstarter that finishes out all the content for Nemesis. Now between this video and the others, we will have looked at literally everything available for Nemesis as of the time of recording in November of 2019. That includes even the stuff that was a promo from Lords of Hellas and the stuff that was available only through the Dice Tower Kickstarter in 2019. All the cosmetic stuff, all the expansion stuff, the stretch goals, the core box, everything. Bear in mind that what we're looking at here is Sundrop, because I like the look of the Sundrop, but I'm also not someone who's going to paint the minis, so I did not opt for painted minis, but otherwise everything else we're going to see is essentially everything. The only difference is not showing painted minis, just Sundrop. I would also note here that this is not a traditional unboxing video for those who are looking for that because I find those pretty dull. Because when you just open up a package and say, look, look how neat it is, that's kind of interesting. But what good does that do in terms of telling you anything about how it actually affects the way the game is played? We're going to look at these components and the stretch goals and everything else as we go through each of these boxes that we haven't looked at yet. But we're going to deal with, in many cases, what these components do for the game itself to change things up or how they are used. So let's dive into it by first recapping what we have seen before, just so you know that videos on those do exist and what is covered together. The first Nemesis video we did here looked at Wave 1. That is the core box with all of its various stretch goals and whatnot, and the so-called Kickstarter bonus content box. Now, bear in mind, that box has stuff in it that's promos for, for instance, Tainted Grail or other fields. The only things related to Nemesis that are in it are Untold Stories number one, which is the co-op comic that sort of leads you through a campaign using the comic to tell the story, and its related tokens, which I've stored in the core box there, okay? So this box is only for those who actually backed the Kickstarter. That's where you get Untold Stories number one, which includes some tokens that you're going to need when playing some of the other stretch goal content, though you could certainly swap them out for something else very easily. For those who are wondering what's in the core box at retail, simply watch that video and ignore the stuff from the Kickstarter bonus content box, Untold Stories and its tokens, because supposedly, I have not checked this myself, the core boxes at retail are identical to the core boxes from Kickstarter. You just don't get the little box that shipped with it back in wave one. Our next look at a Nemesis product was to look at Adrestia. Adrestia is basically an adult intruder mini, Sundrop, that is included as a bonus gift for people who bought Lords of Hellas through that Kickstarter as part of their exclusive gifts, just like some of the Tainted Grail stuff was and the Etherfields card deck was for Nemesis. It came with all the components you would need to actually use Adrestia, the intruder, in a game of Lords of Hellas. It is not playable with Nemesis, other than the fact that you could just use that mini if you needed a spare. That's all. It is promotional only. And most recently, we looked at the Crawl deck. That is that 10-card promo deck, which I have since sleeved, that was available through the Dice Tower 2019 funding Kickstarter, which basically allows any of the characters to move through a technical corridor uh, when not in combat by spending one action card. But there is a drawback that happens. Aside from on this one card here where nothing happens, they all have something bad that happens to you if you try to do it. So a nice risk-reward addition, though... These cards are not quite of the same high quality as the cards in the regular stuff from the Kickstarter campaign, which is unfortunate. Though you can't tell as much of a difference once they're sleeved. So that leaves us with what we're looking at in this video, which is Wave 2. Some of which is stretch goals that were then delivered to everyone. Some of which were paid add-ons available within certain pledges or just paid individually. And two of which were simply cosmetic add-ons that were not available in the Kickstarter campaign itself, but were made available in GameFound, the pledge manager, after the fact to be added when completing your pledge. Awaken Realms tends to do this. A lot of folks tended to miss those, so bear in mind that usually they do that in case you're finishing out your pledge manager for something like Etherfields or the upcoming Great Wall and so on. So let's start out with the stuff that everybody gets, which is the stretch goal box right here in the center. Now, as we look at this, one, we should note that the backers were actually able to vote on what the cover art should be for the Aftermath expansion, which wound up being the box art for the stretch goals as a whole. And we should also note here that many, many, many sort of quality of life stretch goals and adding the mechanic 
character were all things that were actually stretch goals that we already saw that were added to the core box, okay? Uh, in fact, the Untold Stories number one comic was essentially a stretch goal that wound up being made much larger and folded in with another stretch goal that we'll mention here this time around. But all the stretch goals that are left, the Aftermath campaign, the expansion, and the Void Seeders expansion that adds another set of aliens to encounter, those are all in this one box, along with some other odds and ends from among the stretch goals. This is the way that they packaged everything so that they only had to send this one other box to those who only bought the core box pledge. They got the core box, they got their Kickstarter bonus content box, and then they got this. As usual, after opening up the box and taking out any rule books or map boards or anything, it's very well packaged, although I will say that the minis are in a lot tighter in this and the other ones than they were in the core box, which means a lot of folks have had a little bit of concern about possibly either scraping off paint if they paint the minis uh, or possibly breaking them as they get them out. So you want to be careful taking them in and out. This is just one layer. So you've got your lid here and then just one layer of stuff underneath. We're going to start here with the stuff that is not stuff for Aftermath or for Void Seeders, the stuff that's just sort of the odds and ends. At the 20,000 backer mark, rather than a pound amount, this was a campaign done in British pounds, we got a new first player marker to replace the little cardboard one, which is the Catanaut, one of the space cats. Now we'll see an issue later with a couple of things that were promised about how this will differ from the space cats add-on, that was not a promise fulfilled, but you have your space cat, in this case, sun drop the same way as the main characters. And there was a full co-op mode that was part of the stretch goals, which we more or less have seen so far. There was not a separate rule book, but it was included in the main rule book at the 175,500 pound stretch mark. At the 225,000 pound stretch mark, they added supposedly five new primary objectives, which actually wound up becoming seven new solo slash co-op objectives that were already seen in the core box. They also then said they were going to include 10 character achievement cards at the uh, 250,000 pound stretch goal, and that they were going to have an extra starting card for each character at the $1,750,000 stretch goal. What that wound up turning into was that each character instead has two quest cards that can give them different items. And now each character, as of the Stretch Goals box, will have trait cards that we'll look at when we look at the Aftermath expansion, even though it does include trait cards for the characters from the original core box. So they sort of changed that up a little bit. There was to be a story campaign at the $275,000 Stretch Goal, which appears to be what they sort of merged into Untold Stories number one for that co-op campaign that was a comic that was expanded beyond the page count that was actually unlocked through Stretch Goals which leaves the only thing left from the full co-op mode section of their stretch goals as the hourglass at 200,000 pounds. And you might say, well, what's up with the hourglass and how does it affect things if we're looking at a situation where the full co-op mode changed quite a bit over time? It is full co-op mode, just not quite the way that they envisioned it at first. Basically, this is an optional thing you can just put in play. It has nothing to do with co-op. You just do it whenever. And anytime you notice that it has run out of sand, you can snatch it up and cause a noise roll in any room you want, which could theoretically force an encounter. If so, it goes after the player with the lowest number of cards in their hand. Then they put it back out and somebody else could do it on a future turn. But bear in mind that if anybody says, you know what, screw this crap, then after a noise roll, presumably the first time it happens, it can be removed from the game entirely at any player's discretion. Then we have the turrets. Now, the turret minis are actually pretty cool here, right? They look kind of nice. The different levels of sun drop are apparent here. This one's sun drop also, but not nearly as heavily sun drop as the other two you can see there. Now, the minis actually came at the 1,850,000 pound stretch goal. Then at the 1,900,000 pound stretch goal, the idea was to add tokens, 10 of them. And then at the 1,950,000 pound stretch goal, we were going to have a room tile added. Well, what they decided to do was sort of change this up a little bit. And instead of having 10 tokens and the room tile with the three minis, it became nine status tokens, three turret exploration tokens, instead of just the 10 regular and the room tile. 
So the idea is that the room tile is just one of those number two rooms. So it might show up in a game, it might not, but it lets you control the turrets. But you can use them even if this doesn't appear in the game, which is why they changed it up a little bit, because you can still find a turret in a room by just pulling its exploration token and there's a turret in the room. Just like you could pull an exploration token, have something like fire malfunction, whatever, and it's, you know, the number there is going to set your item count in the room, that sort of thing. And just like with the engines, where you have a stack of two different status possibilities that you shuffle, and the top one's the one that tells you what the actual status is of that engine, each of these three turrets gets three turret tokens that get stacked. And the turret can be inactive, which means it does nothing. It can target just intruders, just the aliens, right? Or target all, which means also targeting players. Basically, if it's active for either intruders or all, then when one of them steps into the room, whether it's just an intruder or an intruder or a player, depending on the token, they get shot at. But then that gets resolved during the fire damage step. Uh, any intruder that's in a room with a turret during the fire damage step does take damage from it, but then destroys that turret. The players can take them out with a demolition ability if they want to. But the idea is that in a game without the control room, the status is just the status. Whereas in a game that happens to have the control room in play, the turret room, that would allow you to actually change the status at will. Now the rules for those things are included in the rulebook specifically here for Aftermath. That was a 2,350,000 pound stretch goal. Aftermath adds a new shuttle board here, which has a main room, has three number two rooms available, plus you know technical quarters and stuff like that, and has a new counter here for what are called alerts. This gets placed alongside the regular Nemesis board, generally the normal one, not the hard mode one, and it's treated essentially as if it's part of the ship until it's time for it to leave. You're able to move from this main room into any room that has a technical quarter attached to it in the regular Nemesis board, and you can go from any room on the regular Nemesis board that has a technical quarters entrance into the shuttle. And note that doesn't require the mechanic, it doesn't require uh, the crawl deck, you can just do it. Aftermath then introduces us to five new characters that are all a little bit weird. They do some unusual things. They're designed to be sort of advanced characters, and these were all characters who were discussed among the community during the Kickstarter campaign, and whose actual sculpts and art are exclusive to the Kickstarter campaign. So even if the Aftermath expansion eventually does get a retail release of some kind, the art and the sculpts will be different. This is the CEO, and Sundrop Mini here. He's got his nurse bot with him. So he's sort of like the uh, uh, Mr. Wayland kind of guy. And you'll notice here that as with all the characters, he has an action deck, but his is actually 13 cards thanks to the nurse bot rather than just 10. So the CEO has search, as does everyone, demolition, rest, interruption, and fast repairs. Notice here that little symbol there, that means that this gets actually done by the nurse bot, not by the CEO, which winds up lowering the nurse bot's energy by one. How he gets that energy, we'll talk about in a moment. Then he has authority, stop it, protect. Notice this new symbol here, this X, that basically means that there's no action cost to go with it. You just play it, but it's discarded from the game. It's gone once it's used. It's a one-use, one-trick pony. So you have another protect, then robotic punch, another robotic punch, computer skills, and finally, just one more thing, something that allows you to do something after you've already passed other than just an interruption. Now his starting item is the robot, and this explains how you're gonna wind up being able to keep uh, the energy on the robot. He starts out with five energy, and basically each time you use one of those robot actions, he expends one, but if you get an energy charge item, you can just power him back up again. Then, like all characters, he has two quest items, but interestingly, they're both identical in terms of where you go and what you do to activate them. The key here is that when you activate them, they are two different ones, but the crew, the other players, have no idea which one you've actually gotten access to. 
the pod override is going to let you remove any one escape pod from the game, just blast it out into space, or fix one engine or break one engine of your choice remotely rather than having to actually be in the engine room. And the ship codes let you basically change where you're going, change the destination of the ship at will, or you can use it to grab an item of your choice from any particular item deck, which is really awesome when you're in one of the rooms that lets you pick from any of the three decks. So pick your deck and then search for your item. So basically you can purposely get whatever item you need from the game. And then this is something new. These are those trait cards. It's the art on the back and then a trait that adds some benefit or some drawback or a combination of both for that character to add to their uh, dynamism throughout the game. So in this case, the trait is unlimited ambition. You start the game with a body serious wound. As long as your robot has energy markers, this wound is considered as dressed. Before the game starts, check the corporate objectives of each player, right? Remember, everybody has a corporate objective and a personal objective. He can see all the corporate objectives before play even begins because he's the friggin' CEO. And these were all unlocked in chunks. We've already touched on the unlimited ambition aspect here already. Uh, because we talked about the trait cards and everything. So for the executive, for the CEO, he was unlocked uh, as a mini at the 2,950,000 pound stretch goal mark. He got his board, his tray, and his starting cards at the 3 million pound stretch goal. And then at 3,050,000 pounds, that's when he actually got his action deck, which typically would be, again, 10 cards. He instead gets 13, thanks to the versatility of the robot, but his also weakness as a character without the robot with him. Our next oddball here is the android. The android had its mini unlocked at the 2,200,000 pound stretch goal. Uh, it unlocked its tray slash board and its starting cards at 2,250,000 and then its action cards at 2,300,000. Here's your mini. Right? As for her action cards, as expected, she has search. She has another search. Self-repair. This is her way of healing. She can't heal with normal healing stuff because, you know, she's a friggin' android. Demolition. Interruption. Repairs, regular repairs, computer skills, as you probably expect, direct access, arm tablet, and efficiency, which is nice because she can basically use a room action without paying the cost. Efficiency is pretty cool. Speaking of pretty cool, her starting item is an energy weapon that is an arm gun. It is built into her arm, right? So it's a weapon. But because it is built into her, it doesn't have to go into either hand slots. She's the only character who starts out with two free hands. Then her quest items, we have emergency energy cell and deactivation module. Deactivation module basically lets her uh, discard an action card and one energy marker from this particular card that starts with three to ignore the effects of an intruder attack entirely, which is pretty cool. And the emergency energy cell lets her spend more time. Because see, here's the thing about the android. She's only active until the time tracker in the game reaches spot number five on the time tracker, at which point she friggin' shuts down. She's done. She's gone. She's out of the game. Unless you use this, but that's still only going to let her go until space number three. And yes, she does have to hibernate like any other character to be able to survive. Then you have her trait card. That explains the whole thing about, you know, self-repair and all that kind of stuff, plus a little bit more. Um, one thing that's interesting about this in that first paragraph there is that basically everybody usually draws one personal objective and one corporate objective, and eventually is going to have to pick between the two. She immediately has to get rid of the personal objective and instead draw a second corporate one, which means she's all corporate. She's working for her corporate overlords, not necessarily the CEO. But remember, the CEO can see everybody's corporate objectives. So he can see both of her possible objectives every time they're in the same game. Then next up, we've got the therapist. Mini there. Doing your tablet and watching everybody. The therapist was again unlocked mini, then board and starting cards. 
and then action cards. In this case, at the $2,400,000, $2,450,000, and £2,500,000 stretch goals. Her action cards. Search, and search again. Demolition, rest, interruption, basic repairs, computer skills, then would you kindly, nice reference there to a Bioshock, lend a hand, don't panic. The idea is that many of her abilities essentially rely on manipulating other players or being near other players, so she won't tend to be alone all that much. As for her starting item, she's got just a pistol, an energy weapon pistol with an ammo of three. For her two quest items here, she has the emotion scanner, which allows her to use some of her cards, some of her specific unique cards to her from a neighboring room, which is kind of cool. And she also has the Oculobe drone, which basically sort of lets you read someone's mind. Um, essentially, you give it to another character, and then anytime they do a secret check, like whether the engines are working or not, that they essentially keep to themselves and can lie about if they want to, um, you get to also make that check and find out what the actual situation is. So a lot of the secret checks become non-secret checks. But again, this is more for the semi-co-op game. In co-op, you'd be telling each other anyway. In solo, it wouldn't matter. Then her trait is actually kind of an interesting move action. Essentially, if you're in the room with somebody else and they use a move action to leave that room to go to a neighboring room, you can then pay one action and essentially tag along. And when they get to that room, there's still a noise roll, but the noise roll is only performed by the character who initiated the move, not you, the tag along, who's basically kind of cowering in the corner, I guess. Then we have the convict. The convict was unlocked in the same order at the 2,650,000, 2,700,000, and 2,750,000 pound stretch goals. The convict is kind of the selfish character. The convict winds up sort of a screwing everybody else over sometimes. Cool menu, though. Cool look. Very Bane-esque. Nemesis is yours, right? He has his action cards here. Unsurprisingly, we have search, search, rest, demolition. Then, I need this. Which is kind of interesting here. Basically, you can cancel somebody else's action, um, and this can't be interrupted. Or which is kind of interesting, you can also, you know how whenever somebody gets a new item, you get to draw two and then you pick one and one of them gets discarded and the other one you keep. Well, he can just take the other item that you chose not to keep. Repairs, short temper, basically it's kind of like a Marty McFly banging on the steering wheel. He can actually use a room action even if it's malfunctioning, which is really awesome, but it requires him to perform a noise roll once he does it because he's basically banging on shit. Then... Catch this, which basically lets you drop a heavy item by basically throwing it at an intruder and getting the hell out of the room without triggering an attack. Opportunist. Basically, if you're in a room with somebody else, you can just dodge out the door and slam it behind you and leave them to their fate. Uh, bash, which is a form of a melee attack, but it allows you to score even if you miss. So he's pretty strong, pretty much, you know, kind of all in it for himself, but he's got some complications. You notice here he has two starting items. He starts with the cuffs, okay, which he's wearing when he starts play, which takes up some space for him. And at the start of the game, you're going to give the cuffs key, which is the only thing that can actually get rid of the cuffs, to the bounty hunter character, the other one we haven't looked at yet. And if the bounty hunter isn't present, you give it to any other character of your choice. So whether or not you ever get that hand free again is entirely up to a different character. And notice he doesn't start with a weapon. Presumably that's why he gets the bash ability. And we have two quest items, as one would expect. We have augmented arm, basically sort of helping him out when he's in tough shape. And then pipe. What's interesting about the pipe is that basically when he uses it, he gets flipped over, but then he can find it again and flip it back over. And it basically allows him to avoid contamination with a melee attack when he misses. As for his trait, he is tough. He only dies when receiving any wound after his fourth serious wound instead of his third, but he can still be killed normally by intruder attack card effects. So just in terms of regular damage he can take, he's a hell of a lot tougher than everybody else. But 33% tougher? And then finally for Aftermath, we have the Bounty Hunter. Now, he was unlocked in a slightly different order 
The action cards were actually unlocked first at the 2,800,000 pound stretch goal. The 2,850,000, that's when his miniature was unlocked and actually turned out to be two minis, as we'll see. And then at 2,900,000, that's when the tray and the starting items got unlocked. There's our bounty hunter. A gruff guy there, but he brought along his pooch, Laika. Which is cool. His action cards, we have search, and then search, and rest, and demolition, and interruption, and repairs, as you would expect. Then we have taking aim, tactical move, so some aspects kind of like, you know, soldier and stuff we've seen before, but then go girl, not you go girl, but like go girl, which allows you to move Laika, again, the dog, to a neighboring room or return her back to the board so you can send her out on things to do. And then Sentinel, right? Uh, if she's on the bounty hunter board, basically she helps you ignore a surprise attack sort of by barking, I guess, when the intruder comes in. Or if an intruder attack would kill you, you can discard her entirely, including the trait card, as we'll see, and ignore the attack. So she basically jumps in the way and gets killed. But you survive. So kind of cool there. His starting item is not the cuff keys. Those come with the convict. His is just an uh, energy weapon, a rifle, uh, 247, with an ammo of five. He then has his two quest cards. Then we have aggro override. Say you're in the room with an intruder, and so is Laika. Okay? Instead of Laika leaving the room when you use one of the cards that would send her out of the room, instead she can deal one injury to that intruder and stick around instead of moving, or the seek mod, which lets you basically send her out and perform a search action where she is, and then she returns back and brings the item with her. The trait card explains how the Leica Mini actually works. Basically, before you perform your first action on any game turn, not any round, but any turn, you can move Leica to a neighboring room or call her back by putting her back on the board, regardless of distance, which is cool. Um, when Leica's in the same room as a bounty hunter and an intruder, you'll automatically call her back. She's coming back to basically protect you. And when she's on the main board, she performs a noise roll just like any other characters. And she is considered a player uh, on the left of the bounty hunter when it comes to a player order. But she ignores fire because she can just sort of dodge out of those rooms and is not attacked by intruders. So she has some benefits to her that allow him to sort of have more reach than a character normally would. Now, I did say that when we got to the point of talking about Aftermath characters and trait cards, there were cards for the original game's characters as well, and we'd look at them. That's where we'll take a look at these here. They're included in the Aftermath box, and you can play them with the base game without having to play any of the Aftermath stuff with it other than just the trait cards. But you have Just Die Already for the Captain. Basically, just, you know, you break out your six-shooter and you take a shot, and then without having to pay for it again, you can just basically fire another one. Even multiple times, as long as you've got enough ammo. But it's a bit of a gamble because you don't actually check the injury effect on the intruder until after your last shot, not between shots. So you may wind up using up ammo you didn't need to use. For the pilot, you've got authorization, which allows her to open or close any single door uh, anywhere on the ship when she does the cockpit room action, which is cool. Then the scientist has the wheelchair, right? When he gets a leg serious wound, it's already dressed, right? Because it's not stopping him from walking. Scavenger, when you perform a search action in any white room, draw one item from each item deck and pick and discard the other two. So instead of it being you pick two from one deck, she picks one from each. Interesting. We have uh, the soldier there with Rush. You can deal yourself one light wound and perform three actions in a single round rather than two. And then the mechanic, that stretch goal character, uh, though he's in all the core boxes, has the handyman ability that lets him use his starting and quest items as yellow items when performing a craft item action. Now, before we get to the other components, I would note here that, yes, they did sort of develop this as they went along. It wasn't in full form when the stretch goals were being unlocked, so some things did change. So initially, the idea was that there would be seven crew tokens to represent the original five characters, the mechanic, and the medic for them to possibly run into, uh, those would have been added at the 2,100,000 pound stretch goal mark, and there'd be 10 crew encounter cards in a similar vein at the 2,550,000 pound stretch goal, and then 15 new secret objectives at the 2,150,000 pound stretch goal. Instead, they've tweaked it a bit, and we've got 
uh, some other components here to take a look at that aren't tied to stretch goals per se, but that's where the funding would have gone. All right, so let's talk some other components here. Now, basically, Aftermath is designed as two different things, okay? Yes, in theory, you can take the characters that are with Aftermath and use them in the base game if you want to, but it's not necessarily recommended. You may have noticed as I was going through them that they all have colors that match colors of characters from the base game. The CEO was blue like the captain. The android was green like the pilot. The psychologist was white like the scientist. The bounty hunter was violet like the scout, or purple as I call it. And then the convict was red like the soldier. Uh, there isn't one that's the equivalent of the mechanic, and we will find that the medic is pink, so no equivalent for her. So basically when you're drafting your characters and you pull, say, the red soldier, you actually can choose soldier or convict, and then that's it. But that does mean on purpose, because of balance issues, that you can never have, for instance, two red characters in a game or two blue characters in a game. It's always one or the other. That said, though, instead, they and all these other components are really meant to be played in one of two modes. There is the epilogue mode. Now, the epilogue requires that you finish an original game of Nemesis, and whether anybody wins or loses, the ship is still intact. And basically, you go in, you flip over any unexplored room tiles, you get rid of any fire tokens, any noise tokens, because uh, we're assuming that some time has passed. Uh, you keep any malfunction tokens, and all of your exploration tokens are already now gone. And even on the ones that you just had to flip over if they weren't explored before, you're just using that um, to set any conditions that you need, set yourself up with uh, the number of items in the room, and that's it. But then to still make it dynamic, you have these other exploration tokens that you're going to use within that epilogue for things that will happen when you go into those rooms. It's just that since the item count has already been set, they don't have any numbers on them. So some do something similar to what we've seen before, some do not, and we'll touch on that in a moment. There's also what's referred to as research mode. And both of the modes are going to use most of the same components. You're going to wind up using the shuttle board for all of them. But basically, research mode says you don't have to play a game and then play with the Aftermath stuff. You can just play with the Aftermath stuff to begin with. You have to play with Aftermath characters. It's similar to a regular game, but it's going to swap in some of these components as you play. And when you start out with all these rooms unexplored, there's actually the original exploration tokens on them that set the item count and cause something to happen. And you're going to include these with them. So each one will have two different unexpected things that happen when you go into the room, making it a bit more dangerous. As to what they do, we have three danger tokens. They do exactly like they did before. We have corpse tokens, two of those. That basically just means that, you know, you find a character corpse heavy object in that room. Same thing with the two carcass tokens. They drop intruder carcasses in there. The eggs, four of them, big shock, drops an egg in the room. So this is how those heavy objects get into those rooms. Fire does exactly what it did before. Slime does exactly what it did before, except instead of giving you slime when it emerges, it stays in there. And every time someone enters the room, you get a slime marker, which kind of sucks, but kind of makes sense. It's not like you just walked in the room and something squirted you with slime. The room is covered somewhat in slime, so every time you walk through, you're getting contaminated by it in a sense. Three of those. And then we have three of these new tokens here, that have a bunch of door symbols on them. Basically, the idea there is that you walk into the room and it's a lockdown. Every single door to every other corridor slams shut except the one you came in through, as opposed to the ones in the base game where basically the door you came through slams shut. They've included two new serious wound cards that are actually kind of an inside joke. They weren't intended to be in it, but now we have Melted based on the fact that initially, because of a bad mold, you had some melted soldier minis that went out with Wave 1. So they used the design of the melted soldier mini to give us the melted serious wound here. If your character has a slime marker, each time you pass in the player phase, your character suffers one light wound because the slime is effectively melting you. How very aliens of them. You have five help cards. One side is the aftermath help. The other side is about intruder bag development in general for the main game. Bear in mind, though, that in the epilogue mode, there is no intruder bag development. There are three new special crafted item cards. Um, it's two each for three different types, so it's a total of six cards, even though 
the uh, manual says there should be nine. It is only supposed to be six, and they can only be used in a special crafting room. When you go to the crafting room and actually use its ability, you can, for instance, turn an energy charge into a laser pointer. You could change uh, clothes into an enviro suit, or you could change uh, tools into a combat drone. There's that crafting room there. It also allows for items from all three different types of decks, which is nice. There are also two other rooms. They are all number two rooms. We have the alarm room, which basically lets you to choose any other room that doesn't have a character in it and perform a noise roll there um, that could trigger an encounter, but the encounter that it triggers won't have a surprise attack with it. Then you have the server room, which basically lets you go in there and remotely use the room action of any working, non-malfunctioning room that has a computer in it. Then there's 10 new Aftermath event cards. If you're playing epilogue mode, these are the only event cards. If you're playing research mode, you pull out some specific event cards from the base game and shuffle them in with these 10. Okay. We have Maneuver, Infested Supplies, notice that symbol there, we'll come back to that, Adaptability, Screeching, Sparks, Warbling, Dripping, Slimy, Royal Ceremony, Eggs Hatching. Yeah. Now some of them are just normal events. You notice that some have this alert symbol on it. Now if you're playing in the epilogue mode, then you draw this, you see that symbol there, that just means you perform a noise roll, and that's it, because alerts are already doing their own thing. On the other hand, if you're playing the research mode and you draw this where you see that event symbol there, then you're gonna have to break out an event and basically you have five turns in which to actually resolve that event. We'll look back at the shuttle board in a moment to show you how you track that. Speaking of alerts, that's what these are, okay? In the epilogue game, you're gonna start out with one of these and you have two turns in which to resolve it. Otherwise, you're all screwed, game over. But then after you resolve the first one and do a check at a certain point on the time track, you're gonna wind up drawing a second one and you have to knock out that second one as well in two turns before the game ends. Otherwise, again, you all die. Whereas in the research mode, you have five turns to resolve it or you all die. You might be wondering, wait, in the research mode, what happens if you're still working on it during those five turns and another alert comes up? No, you just ignore it if a second one comes up. Now, as for these alerts, they are set just like objectives are with a number of players. Some of them have a spot where you have to actually put a little counter to make sure you've done a first step. Like in this case, scrambled eggs for a billion. Take two intruder eggs to the main room. So the first time you do, you'll put one there so you know you've done it once and then it's resolved after the next time. Goo examination. Map update, two steps. One, put the tracker and then do the next piece here. Decaying samples. Kill the alpha. Get fuel. Recover samples, decontamination procedure, disarming the bomb, escape control. We're back to the beginning again. Again, not many of these. There's only 10 of them, but it makes for a pretty dynamic and frantic game where you really need to work with each other before stabbing each other in the back. Here's what I'm talking about tracking-wise. You'll start at 5. That's when you'll have your first alert in epilogue mode. At 3, that's when you check to see if you have actually fulfilled it. Then you draw a new one if you have. Then that brings you to the one where you check again, and so on. That last marker is when it leaves. Now, in research mode, you're using the regular corporate and personal objectives, but in epilogue mode, every character will draw a random personal requirement that must be met for them to be part of winning when the game is over. Uh, the idea with the epilogue is just that when the timer counts down to zero, then the shuttle takes off. As for 13 possible personal requirements, again, different depending on the number of characters, which ones are available. We have scuttle the ship, destroying the evidence, log in, bringing specimen, trophy, friends until the grave, collector, field trials, madness, crafty, finders keepers, another madness there, destination earth, and then we're back to scuttle the ship again. Now what's interesting also is they've got kind of a weird card here as well called the lucrative offer for epilogue mode. Essentially, at any point, you could just abandon your own personal requirement and instead send the signal 
and escape on an escape pod with an intruder egg. Basically, if you pull that off and you pass the contamination check so you don't die in the escape pod, you've got a solid victory there. It's not necessarily easy because you got some stuff you got to do first, but you can toss your personal requirement out the window, say screw the alerts and screw everybody else and get the hell out of there. That brings us to the other main part of the Stretch Goals box, which is the Void Seeders expansion, which introduces a new alien race. Kind of. Because really only two of the different mini types are actually real. The rest are all sort of figments of the crew's imagination as they're going freaking bonkers. So, the Void Seeders, which is now two words, by the way, and I kept saying Void Seekers, it is Seeders and has been all along, um, starts out, of course, with the rule book there, which was the $1,050,000 stretch goal. At one point, there was supposed to be two new combat dice added at the £1,300,000 stretch goal, but that was dropped. Now, since we're talking about a new alien race, that means a bunch of new aliens. Um, bear in mind here, I would say, um, the ones you're going to be seeing here, these are Sundrop, right? These are purple Sundrop, but honestly, some of them look a little purple and most of them look a bit gray. I was actually pretty disappointed with how the Sundrop turned out on Void Cedars. Uh, in particular, some of mine, I mean, really don't look like they have hardly any purple whatsoever, but whatever, neither here nor there, I suppose. This is the Despoiler, again, the equivalent of the Queen, unlocked at the 1 million pound stretch goal mark. Okay, notice no base, it's the only mini from the regular game and regular stretch goals with no base whatsoever. Kind of creepy looking. This sucker can't take actual damage and be defeated normally. Instead, you have to take out the three layers, which are basically what are on the ship causing everybody to go nuts. The only other thing that physically exists. There are three of those. These are the layers. They kind of look like little egg nests here. This is the closest one to purple that you'll see here. The other ones really just kind of look a lot like the sun drop on the uh, player characters there. Those layers were added at the 1,450,000 pound stretch goal mark. Then you got the six lurkers here. Let's see. Kind of feel for these here. These are unlocked three at a time at the 1,200,000 stretch goal mark and the uh, 1,250,000 mark. Then we have the four whisperers, a little bit bigger. The Whispers were unlocked two at a time at the 1,350,000 and 1,400,000 marks. Then one Stalker at 1,550,000. Now as far as the other cardboard components for Void Seeders, we have a Void Seeder board. Um, it does give you a quick check of what the different symbols mean in terms of the uh, intruder types and the equivalent types for the Void Seeders. Bear in mind there isn't an equivalent of the Larva, so the Creeper equivalent is a Lurker, Adult is a Whisperer, Breeder is a Stalker, Queen is a Despoiler, as you probably would have guessed. In order to destroy the Queen slash Despoiler, you can't attack her directly. Like I said, you have to destroy the three layers. So when you destroy them, you put them on here to know that they're destroyed, so that when the third one hits, that one is gone. Um, you have three different spots for weaknesses, as you do for the Intruders. Intruder egg and intruder carcass, you still check. Um, the difference here being that not all of them will leave a carcass because not all of them are real. Um, only the layers will leave an intruder carcass here. And the character insanity level check is there instead of a character corpse. So somebody uh, who is of a certain insanity level, like is three or above, you can take and you can analyze them to figure out that weakness. Eggs in the nest is still a thing as well. Uh, this board was added to the game at the... 1,150,000 pound stretch goal. Then initially at the 1,450,000 pound stretch goal, they were going to have 20 insanity tokens. Now it's actually 17 void cedar tokens and seven insanity tokens. The insanity tokens all look like this, but they're different colors based on the different character types, right? So as I mentioned, the colors before, right? The blue, the green, and so on, including the ones for mechanic and medic, this basically, when you draw this out of the intruder bag, you wind up having to do a panic card resolution. And then as far as actually drawing from the bag, you're not actually drawing from the bag to determine which of the alien creatures you then encounter, because that's actually determined by your space on an insanity track, which is on a card we'll look at here in a moment. So instead, those 17 tokens here that go in the bag don't have symbols on the back, although the rulebook erroneously says they do, which 
drives people nuts because they're constantly asking questions about it. Instead, these are just used to determine, for example, uh, you know, surprise attacks, just like the numbers generally do. It's just now they're two-sided because you don't need the symbol on one side or the other. As for the other tokens here, to figure out which room is going to have a layer in it, you've got new exploration tokens that get used to determine that, and as always, set an item count for one used in the base game. And then, of course, we have our card components here. Uh, there were five help cards that were added in that were not a stretch goal. They just give you a rundown of how the event phase and player phase work for Void Seeders, though they left out the space there, so who knows what the hell they're trying to call them here. Uh, and then we have the intruder bag development breakdown and how lurking works for this. Lurking is kind of interesting because basically, let's say you leave a Void Seeder alone in a room, so it's not in combat with somebody. There's nobody in any of the rooms around it either. You place a noise marker in the quarter connected to any rooms that are like that, but then all the Void Seeders disappear. You add a token into the bag for each one that was removed that way. So it's kind of this idea that these are horrible figments of your imagination trying to kill you, so when you lose line of sight, it's like they sort of fade away, but they will be back to kill you. Very horror movie-esque. Five of these for five players. Also not mentioned initially on the Kickstarter, nor in the content list for the Void Seeders rulebook for some freaking reason, are the Insanity Tracks. These are small cards, five, one for each player. You sit them on your character board uh, over top of where you would normally put a larva, the little miniature symbol, and this is how you keep track of your insanity level. Um, you can go back and forth between one and two if you have something that lets you drop it once you've gained it, but then once you hit three, you can't go back down to two, and then it's moving between three, four, and five. You hit five, you're at the maximum, and if something comes along to cause you to gain more insanity, you die instantly. Um, this is what's going to determine what type of intruder you encounter when you have one, as opposed to, again, the tokens. Um, it's kind of cool. Uh, what's interesting about this, in part, is that basically um, this is going to also determine what happens when you draw a panic card as well. So lots of stuff tied into this, which is another thing you track on your board. Speaking of panic cards, initially called insanity cards, there are 20 of them, and they were the 1.5 million pound stretch goal. So these are what you wind up having to draw at certain points, and there's the insanity symbol, and then a number right there. If you have lower than that, it doesn't trigger, or if you can't trigger it based on the circumstances, it just doesn't make sense within the context of the game to trigger what it's telling you to do, you can't meet the requirements, then you add one to your insanity track on those little cards, right? Uh, otherwise, you do whatever the requirement is. And there's some pretty screwed up stuff in some cases, like ripping off the bandages, times two, blind escape, destructive outburst, demotivation, insane courage, sabotage, times two, hallucinations, times two, hopelessness, bloodlust, times two, defeatism, self-mutilation, times two, pyromaniac, destruction, heart attack, your character flippin' dies, but that's only if you got five already. And then another heart attack, and we're back to ripping off the bandages again. Another thing that's cool about those panic cards, though, is that if you have to draw a panic card and have to resolve its effect, somebody else could use an interruption card to cause you to not have to do it and not have to add any insanity to your insanity track. It essentially makes it like that card draw never happened in the first place. Kind of like somebody in the room with you saying, dude, chill, what the hell is wrong with you at that moment to calm things down? I really like that mechanic. We then have 20 new Void Seeder event cards uh, unlocked at the 1,150,000 pound stretch goal. We have Monophobia, Agoraphobia, Neurosis, Hunt, times three, we have fear, times two, terror, times three, whispers, times two, ship AI failure, fire wave, fuel explosion, evacuation pod ejection, computer system failure, generator overheat, yikes. Then we have 20 Void Seeder attack cards unlocked at the 1,100,000 pound stretch goal. We have Brain Eating, times two. Dread, times two. 
duplicate times two. It was duplicated. Frenzy times two. Bite ew, times four. Dismay times four. Very Cthulhu esque, I think. Scratch times four. And lastly, eight void cedar weaknesses that you could find. We have solid bulkheads, rational thinking, reaction to danger, weakened apparitions, strong convictions, determination, wave of calm, mental fortitude. Now, again, the whole idea is that it's all psychological, which makes this a very different game. It almost feels kind of like something like Event Horizon rather than feeling like Alien. It's a really cool twist on the Nemesis model, but it is meant to only be used in conjunction with the base game. You wouldn't necessarily take Void Cedars and use it for research mode, though I guess you could, and you wouldn't necessarily use it for uh, epilogue in particular. Now we are finally through the stretch goal box, though I would note that with playing as an intruder, the rules were in the core rule book at the 300,000 pound stretch goal mark, but five intruder objective cards became 10 intruder action cards at 350,000. The intruder player board was dropped from the game, but it would have been the stretch goal at 325,000. So that's all stuff that we have seen before, but I did want to note it here since it did include some unaccounted for stretch goals. Now, what we're seeing here is also something that is packed into that box if you ordered it. This is the Medic character expansion, the pink character, a unique color with some unique abilities. Um, she was 7.5 pounds. You could also have gotten her for free if you were a first 24-hour backer. She has her own character tray slash board, as you would expect. Here's her mini. She has a little ring here, as the original characters did. I would note that there's a lot of complaints that the bases on the Aftermath characters are slightly small relative to those rings, so they don't quite stay on. Because you may want to pick her as a character, we have draft cards. For some reason, they give you two instead of just one. And then she's going to have her own action deck, as one would expect. So we have ER, Field Dressing, Pharmacist, Computer Skills, Repairs, Interruption, Demolition, Rest, Search, and Search. So mostly what you would expect, but some cool separate medic abilities. Her starting item's kind of cool. It's a needle gun. It has a charge of only two, or ammo of only two, but it causes an intruder to retreat instead of being dealt injuries. Um, but you can only reload it with chemicals. But that basically means that instead of shooting at an intruder and possibly having them still sitting there trying to freaking kill you next time around, she can cause them to retreat for sure. But they're not taking damage. Of course, when they retreat, their damage disappears off them anyway, so what does it matter? Then you've got her two quest items. We have combat drugs. Okay? And then we have surgery kit. And her trait is altruist. So when she uh, heals or dresses wounds, she winds up getting an action card back for her troubles. But all of that, folks, was just in this one box, and we've still got several to go. Next up, we have a paid add-on here. This is the Carnomorphs expansion. It's another alien race that plays very, very differently. I would note here that the community during the Kickstarter campaign got to vote on which of the two alien races, Void Seeders or Carnomorphs, would wind up being the one that was a stretch goal, while the other one wound up being an add-on that could be bought, but which wasn't free. They've done this previously with their other campaigns as well. So we're going to start out here with our rule book, which is oriented a little bit differently, relatively short, and a Carnomorph board, because you're going to need a board to handle the different alien types. Again, no equivalent of a larva, but our creepers are metagorgers, the adults are shamblers, the breeders are flesh beasts, and the queen is known as the butcher. There is a place for eggs in the nest, as usual. What's different about this is the Carnomorph adaptations. Instead of having weaknesses, think of this game as like hard mode when you're playing with the Carnomorphs. And again, it's meant to be mixed with the base game rather than the Aftermath stuff. You have the Shambler, Flesh Beast, and Butcher slots here for the Character Corpse, Intruder Corpse, and Intruder Egg weaknesses, so to speak. The idea is that you have these Carnomorph adaptation cards that make them even friggin' stronger. And you'll sit that 
card face down in the slot with the mini of a shambler, a flesh beast, or a butcher sitting on top of them. And the first time one of those alien types actually enters the game, enters the ship, you take it off of here and put it on the map and flip that over. And that adaptation becomes active to make them stronger until you do, you know, the laboratory action, the uh, examination that normally would flip over a weakness. And what it does is it gets rid of that adaptation, that advantage that they got when that first one of that type came onto the board. Again, once you get that lid off, it's got the tray in, everything's packed very nicely, albeit tightly, and this time the sun drop really took well. These are our new minis, and they're pretty disgusting. I mean, the idea is that um, a cat was loose on the ship when they went to hyperspace the last time, and it got smushed, it got splattered. But some alien XNA mixed in with that remains, and started creating these sort of zombie flesh creatures that grow and evolve as they eat each other and eat other objects, like heavy objects in the game, like eggs and whatnot, and just kind of grow stronger as they go. And when uh, damaged up to a certain point, they wind up sort of reverting back to a previous state. And in the process, as they're attacking you, they cause mutations in you as well. It's pretty intense stuff. Um, pretty cool. Pretty intense stuff. The equivalent of the queen for these guys is the butcher. Baker and Candlestick Maker must be in the next expansion. The butcher. Once he's dead, by the way, he cannot come back, which is nice. I mean, sort of the final form here. Then you've got a step down, three of these guys known as the Flesh Beasts. In the Alien Kings set, we will find that it looks like these are the ones that are replaced, not the actual Queen slash Butcher. Then you have eight of these guys called Shamblers. Yee. No alternate sculpts, by the way, amongst any of those. Then we have eight of what are called Metagorgers, which are not only the smallest type that there is, but a type that can get fed on by the others and even their own type to cause them to grow. So they can eat heavy objects, but also each other. For the Metagorgers, there are two sculpts, four of each for a total of eight. One kind of spider-ish, one kind of scorpion-esque. Token-wise, there's not many. Uh, you have your intruder carcass tokens, because you'll need those more often. There's a feeding phase in the event phase where basically they go through uh, and they you know, devour something and can evolve. But that evolution also means you don't actually wind up with uh, tokens that go in the bag for each individual step of the evolution. Instead, you just have one for the flesh beast... And you have two blue Metagorger tokens and then eight red Metagorger tokens. And the idea is that if you draw a blue one, then uh, all the players perform a noise roll in order, except if a character's already in combat, then you remove that token and put another Metagorger token in there, and you are forced to default to always putting in the red ones first. So if there happens to be one out, it goes in. Uh, if you draw a red one instead, you place a Metagorger miniature in each room that already contains one, even if it's in combat, or that already contains a heavy object uh, even if the object is in somebody's hands. You would also put one in the nest if it's explored and not destroyed, regardless of whether there's any eggs in there, which would be another heavy object. And then as they go along, as they feed, they evolve from one to the next higher step. Essentially, the butcher feeds first, and then the flesh beast, the shambler, the metagorger, it goes down the line with the more powerful ones feeding first. But then the order in which they actually feed uh, on whatever item happens to be in there. The red character corpse can be eaten, um, the intruder egg, the intruder carcass, another metagorger, uh, or the blue character corpse. And yes, the blue character corpse being eaten does mean that one of the objectives might be able to be made literally impossible within it. Uh, and when that happens, you basically remove all the injury markers off the carnomorph, and then they do that eating. The thing they ate is gone, and then they evolve. There are some contingencies in cases where you've already used all the minis or you're dealing with the butcher or whatever, which you can see in the rulebook.
As you'd expect, by the way, surprise attacks are still a thing, though, so they do have the warnings on the back. But not a lot of tokens this time. Then, of course, we have our various card types. There's only one of the small type. That's those Carnomorph adaptations. Again, these make them stronger, so you're trying to get rid of them rather than these being weaknesses. So we have Tentacle, Agile, Regenerative Tissue, Voracious, Changeling, Quickening, not Highlander, Fire Resistant, Genetic Malfunction, so eight of these. We again have five help cards, player phase and event phase and how that works for Carnomorphs, and then intruder bag development tips here to make sure you're doing it correctly. The Carnomorphs are going to attack you a lot and try to eat you, so we have our Carnomorph attack deck here, 20 cards. They all have different values up here for checking injuries, though, depending on type. Uh, we have our Metagorger versus basically everybody else, but otherwise it works the same. Okay, we have here Slash times three, Whiplash times five, Bite times four, Regurgitate ew, times two, Bash times two, Spawn times two, Devour times two. Now, Devour is kind of ugly. If a character has at least one serious wound, they die. If not, they suffer a serious wound, and the Butcher removes all of its injury markers. Note, it's only something the Butcher can do, but holy shit, it's basically a you're-dead-in-one-shot type of attack. Damn. Then we got our 20 event cards for Carnomorphs. Rampant Mutation times two. Stalking times two. Beast on the Prowl. Ammunition Meltdown, Generator Overload, Emergency Protocol Failure, Structural Weakness, Scavenging Biomatter, Reawakening, times two, Growl, Marked Prey, Chemical Fire, Quarantine Procedure, Airlock Procedure Glitch, Lurking, times two, and finally Evacuation Hatches Jam. So as you play, you can wind up getting infected. And in the case, for instance, of a Metagorger attack, it's pretty much automatic during that type of attack. Uh, it can also happen through other means as well. But when that happens, you take a Contamination card, but you also take a Character Mutation card if you don't have one yet. That Character Mutation card can actually be treated and got rid of. And you are going to want to do that using either a Surgery or the Antidote, because what happens if you get hit again, and you're supposed to take another Character Mutation, but you've already got a card that adds a character mutation marker onto your player board. And when you get your fourth marker on your player board, you're dead. So it's this and then four more, so a total of five. The fifth time, you're dead. But if you can heal this and get rid of it, then the next time just gives you one of these again instead of adding to the up to four that could kill you sitting on your player card. Now, as far as these things go, they're kind of beneficial, yet also kind of you know, screwy. I like them. <laughs> I actually think they're probably the coolest part, aside from the feeding of Carnomorphs. Um, but I'm kind of weird that way, I suppose. So we have a total of 12 of these. And you notice that each one is going to have an infected or not infected ability. And when you first get it, it's going to be face down. Nobody knows what it is until you decide to use it, if you decide to use it. If you decide to use it, you're going to wind up taking one mutation marker, which Kind of sucks, because again, that's getting you towards the four that can kill you. And then you're going to take a contamination card from your hand, so it has to be one in your hand, and you're going to scan it. And if it's infected, you get this ability. If it's not infected, you get this ability. At which point, you take that contamination card that was not infected, you get rid of it, and you draw a new one in its place, which may be infected. So each time you use the ability, you're getting hit for another mutation marker, and you're running the risk of more infection. Yikes, right? Though I would note the contamination check works a little bit different at the end. It's not an insta-death thing so much as each infected card that you wind up having uh, among your contamination cards adds another mutation marker. And if you hit four, you die again. So uh, it's all still very thematic, but it works a little bit differently than the regular game. So these abilities, we have Adaptation, Escape Master, Contortionist, 
scream, genetic malfunction, boiling blood, sharpened senses, mimicry, shapeshift, <laughs> gastronomical revolution, yikes, and regenerative tissue, and then finally, claw. So is it awesome? Yes. Is it freaking gross? Yes. Is it awesome because it's gross? Kind of, actually. I really dig the Carnomorphs expansion. It was a 30-pound expansion as far as cost goes against British pounds. Uh, it was included in the Intruder Pledge, or in my case, the Sun Drop Intruder Pledge, but it could be added to any of the other pledges. Now we're finally getting into the smaller stuff. Thank goodness. The Terrain expansion was a 20-pound expansion. You could get this in the Captain's Collection, which is just the core set, stretch goals, this, and the art book. Or it was included in the Intruder All-In Pledge, either some drop or not. Uh, it's basically cosmetic stuff to swap out some tokens and such within the game itself. In fact, much of what we'll see from here on is cosmetic stuff. When you open it, you essentially have two layers of stuff. You got the one layer with one underneath it with no plastic over top of it. This is the first layer of stuff here. They're just replacements for the doors and the escape pods. So you got some of the doors has sort of that corner damage there. The other ones have gashes through them. Again, sun drop in this case. And you have four escape pods with spaces for two figures, though, again, mismatch in size. If you have them inside the little plastic rings, they may not fit. You might want to just play without the plastic rings at this point, which are used for counters in Untold Stories number one anyway, rather than putting them on the characters. But I would note here with these, no numbers. So when it tells you to do the escape pod numbers, you may want to do that with the tokens before you then bust out these to replace them during setup. And then the second layer is eight eggs to replace the egg tokens. I don't think I ever would have expected these to be what the eggs looked like. Would have thought more alien, but okay, whatever. More alien like the film. Um, they're a bit spiky, which given the fact that they are pretty tightly in the packaging there makes them kind of hard on the fingers to actually pull out. And you have five different character corpses here to replace your character corpse tokens designed somewhat around the core game characters, but not entirely. For instance, you're not going to see one, you know, with a wheelchair. Again, just cosmetic to replace the tokens. That's all the terrain expansion is. Cosmetic to replace something that exists already as cardboard. Again, also included in the Captain's Pledge or in the Intruder Pledge of either type was the art book. It is like just about any other Awaken Realms art book. It is just straight art. Right? I mean, it's nice art. It's cool art. It's pretty sweet art. It includes the later materials in the art, but it is just, you know, an art book. You could have bought it separately for 15 pounds or gotten it as part of the pledges. One of the other really cool things here in Wave 2 is something that's both really cool and a major disappointment for many people. You see, at the end of Untold Stories number one, we were given sort of a preview of what to expect for Untold Stories number two. Here's number one. It says, coming soon, Untold Stories number two, the Nemesis single player campaign. That is not what Untold Stories number two wound up being. And there were a lot of people who saw when Wave 1 material was coming out that Untold Stories number 1 said that number 2 would be a solo campaign, got all excited, and when the pledge manager reopened between Waves 1 and 2, added Untold Stories number 2 to their pledges when they hadn't had it there before, specifically because they wanted that solo experience. That is not what it turned out to be. We're told that, well, that page that said, you know, the single-player campaign was what was coming in number two, that was actually something that was from an earlier draft of Untold Stories number one, and it shouldn't have still been in there. But it was something that was never clarified until Wave 2 started to freaking ship. What it is instead is a set of events that you can build in with a comic-style script into your regular semi-cooperative game. Still scripted very much like Untold Stories number one, but instead, it's not one main campaign scenario. It's something that adds a lot of replayability and some cool stuff into the game, but it's not one big campaign. And again, it's not solo. 
what's going to happen is you're going to have this special event deck. And at first, you're going to draft during your game setup one of these cards, and that'll tell you which storyline you're running out of seven. Nemesis Run, Wildfire, Midnight, Sunburn, Watchers, Feral, and Voyagers. The top is basically having you set up some stuff for that particular scenario. But then as you play, there'll be times where you have to draw an event card. When you draw a card, you ignore this stuff, and instead you look at the bottom, find which one you're actually running. Like for Nemesis Run, on the next card you'd find Nemesis Run, and it tells you what event to go to and proceed from there. There are various choices. You'll use some of the on-entry and on-use type of tokens, a lot of the tokens that were used for Untold Stories number one as part of this, as you play through this scenario, which is kind of cool. Lots of replayability built into this. Again, the scenarios are Nemesis Run, Voyagers, Watchers, Midnight, Feral, Sunburn, and Wildfire. You're going to get three of this, which is the Draw Another Comic Event card. Basically, it forces you to draw another one when you're drafting, but that gives them enough cards, ten cards with different things to point you to, to actually use all the different options and that sort of thing, make it very dynamic. And sometimes it'll have you put some things into rooms that haven't been explored yet. So you'll put them on this little card here, same on either side, as a way of, you know, holding onto those things until the room is revealed, and then you just move it and put it on that revealed room. So for all those who get their Nemesis stuff and go, what the heck are those cards that are in there loose, man? Therefore, Untold Stories number two, just like the tokens inside that uh, bonus Kickstarter content box were tokens that went with Untold Stories number one. But again, Untold Stories number two is not a solo campaign as advertised in Untold Stories number one. And I know the color of that comic is just completely screwing up any of the color of the uh, image you're seeing right now. But uh, last note here with this is this was in the Sundrop and the non-Sundrop Intruder pledges was not in any of the other pledges, but you could add it for eight pounds. Now we're finally coming to the end. There's just two more products to look at, and both of those were ones that were added to GameFound as optional cosmetic purchases that were not in the Kickstarter campaign, which also means they were not in any actual pledge levels. So some people missed these because they didn't look around GameFound when they went in to actually finalize their pledges. This one is the 15-pound Space Cats collection. The idea was that they created Space Cats to represent not just that first player token where the Space Cat is there, the Catanaut, right, is there in the space suit, but also created one each to represent the different alien types. Um, there was some voting as to which one would be the first player token. The ones that weren't chosen were added to this. Now, I would note here that in the description on GameFound, they said that these space cats were going to be bigger in scale than the first player token. That turned out not to be the case. They're the same size. They also said that the first player marker, Catanaut, right, the astronaut cat, was going to have a different base as the stretch goal versus the bigger version that would be inside this. Also not true, they are identical minis. So if you get this, you got the stretch goal one and this one. So you got one duplicate and then the three for the alien races. Again, nicely packed. And we have four art cards representing the different types for Void, Cedar, Carnomorph, Intruder, and Catanaut here. Those are Catanaut. Again, we've seen that one before. The Intruder version, probably my favorite one. The Void Cedar version, and bear in mind these are all Sundrop, but they're Sundrop in the same way as like the Terrain expansion or the Heroes, not the different colors of the uh, individual alien races. And then the Carnomorph one, probably my second favorite of them. So again, all cosmetic. I tend to use them as first player markers depending on which uh, alien race we're playing as most of the time. Uh, as for those cards, though, by the way, you'll notice those were just art cards, and I put sleeves on them. Officially, if you get the pledge uh, and do the add-on that's going to include sleeves that are supposed to cover everything, what they will send you are sleeves from the brand Paladin, and you're going to get eight packs of Percival, eight packs of Arthur. Percival are the large ones. Arthur are the small ones. Each pack has 55 sleeves in it of either type. You are going to have plenty of Arthur. In fact, you'll have some left over. Of the Percival ones, 
if you sleeve the art cards, not just the gameplay cards, but the art cards with the concept art from the core box and the ones from Space Cats, you're going to run out of sleeves. You'll need one more pack of Percival. If you don't sleeve those, you're fine. For me, I have the Crawl deck, which was outside of the Kickstarter, so I was going to need more sleeves anyway, so I just bought one extra Percival pack on the side. But bear in mind, you will need one more if you plan to literally sleeve everything rather than just sleeving all the gameplay-related stuff. I just want to protect everything. And finally, we come to the last of the items for Wave 2 of Nemesis, which is Nemesis Kings. This is probably the one that has the most people kicking themselves because they didn't see it in Game Found when they just jumped in and finalized their pledge. Alien Kings was something that was available for £30 as an add-on. The Kings is basically just alternate sculpts that are theoretically for the Queen versions of the different races, but again, since there are three actually in there for the Carnomorphs, I actually tend to think of those as replacements for the Flesh Beasts, not the Butcher. And then the other two, the ones for the Void Seeder there to replace the Despoiler, and the one for the Intruders to replace the Queen, do match that Kings for Queens swap out. There are no new gameplay elements involved. It is just a cosmetic expansion, though people on board GameGeek and elsewhere are creating their own sort of house rules for how to use these in some alternate way. As always, they are superbly packed, and here they are. Each one's sun drop, thankfully, in the color of its particular alien race, rather than being sun drop in just the regular hero color, because that would look kind of weird on the board. So to replace the intruder queen, here's our intruder king. Also without a base, to replace our despoiler, Void Cedar King. Again, theoretically purple. Looks more gray to me. And then three identical, again, I would assume to replace Flesh Beast instead of Butcher's, Carnomorph Kings. It's nasty. It's like he's got like a zipper that just opens his front. It just, woo! Probably the nastiest looking of the Carnomorphs. And that's saying something. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, all of the material available at this point for the game Nemesis from Awakened Realms through both Kickstarter and some odds and ends here and there. Again, we have the core box. It came with the Kickstarter bonus content box, which includes Untold Stories number one, plus some promotional stuff for Tainted Grail and other fields. The Stretch Goals box, which includes Aftermath, Void Cedars, and some odds and ends. Then the paid add-on Carnomorphs, the paid add-on Terrain Expansion, both of which were part of the Kickstarter campaign, the Nemesis Kings and Space Cats, which were added to Game Found after the fact and not part of the Kickstarter, and then also from the Kickstarter campaign, we had the Nemesis Untold Stories number two with its cards, and we had the Nemesis Art Book. As a free gift from Lords of Hellas, you have the Adrestia promo, not for use gameplay-wise with Nemesis, but does include an adult intruder, for use with Lords of Hellas, and we have the Crawl deck available through the Dice Tower 2019 Kickstarter. It's a lot of stuff. It is a fantastic game. Not counting the Crawl deck or Adrestia, what you're looking at here is basically 252.5 pounds in terms of a pledge, uh, along then with shipping on top of that, whether it was single shipment or split shipment. Uh, I did split, of course, for Wave 1 and Wave 2. I thought this was going to be the biggest game I ever bought, and it's a hell of a game. And now I have Tainted Grail on the way, which was significantly more expensive, and then Other Fields is coming soon as well. Uh, Awakened Realms does some fantastic games, but they're enormous, and they're expensive if you want everything. But honestly, everything is really sweet when it comes to their games. I'm glad I did it. Now I just got to make sure I have the shelf space to put these away. We will be returning soon to Awakened Realms, by the way, when Wave 1 of Tainted Grail hits my doorstep. See you then, and I hope you've enjoyed this look at Wave 2 of Nemesis, along with our previous coverage.